Hello everyone. I'm Sebastian Böcker from the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena. And this is a behind the scenes talk for Canopus. We start with the usual disclaimer. This is behind the scenes talk. This is not a talk. This is not a tutorial that explains to you how to use our software. We have such tutorials available. Please watch those in case you're interested in learning how to use the software. But here I'm trying to explain how things work, why they work, why we did it this way and not the other way and so on. Now, before we start, I have to say a lot of thank you to the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft and I should have done that in the other talks already. So I do that at a very prominent position here. The Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft has funded our research for many, many years. They have funded it when I think most people on the applied side still thought that our methods cannot work and will never lead to anything useful. And sometimes these people said that in reviews and nevertheless, we got funding and that's why we finally ended up with what I present today. So thanks a lot. This is a talk that stands on a series of talks, which you might have already heard. Um, we have different approaches and previous talks already covered Sirius and Zodiac and CSI finger ID. By the way, as usual, I'm talking about approaches here, scientific approaches, not about software, because in the end, the software is what comes out of it, but that's for us at least not the interesting part. And that's also not very helpful to understand how the methods are working. So as mentioned, this talk is about Canopus. Now, another slide, which I have should have shown earlier, which is the design paradigms behind our methods that might be known to people from bioinformatics, but yeah, people who are using our tools might not be aware that there are certain paradigms that we try to follow and that we sometimes have to trade one for another. And that is power. Obviously, we want to reach very good results. CSI finger ID is probably by far the best tool for searching in a structured database. But we also want universality. And that is, in principle, our approaches work for all metabolites and classes. And if they don't, such as CSI finger ID for lipids, then we explicitly mention it and ex mention why it's it's not a problem of CSI finger ID. No in silico method, the in silico method that I talked about in the last talk would be able to search for lipids. Then there is speed. We want to make our methods fast and we often have to trade power for speed or vice versa. You might say, but it's still so slow, but I have to tell you, if we wouldn't invest so much time in making our methods faster, they would be 10,000 times slower and that would really hurt, I would say. And then there are also two design paradigms which people are probably not aware of or don't think they are important, which are simplicity and scientific elegance. So if there are different solutions available, and they have the same power and same speed, more or less, then we always go for the simpler method. And we always try to also get some scientific elegance into our methods. And that is not just for the sake of itself, that is for a reason. I've come to learn that a method that tries to, yeah, have some scientific elegance usually works well also for new data. Whereas something that you put together, like, I don't know, very quickly built house where, where things are not at the right position. At some stage, you will notice that. At some stage, things fall, uh, start falling apart. We don't want that. So I'll come back to that every now and then and mention why we made a decision in this way or another. So now the usual setting the stage slide. I already talked about that a lot in the Sirius and Zodiac talk. So if you want to know more details, please have a look there. But very quickly going through it, we are talking about small molecules of biological interest, including a lot of other stuff, drugs, toxic compounds, and so on, which I will shortly talk about as biomolecules. 
We are talking about liquid chromatography mass spectrometry data. We are talking about tandem mass spectrometry data, which I will abbreviate MSMS. Sometimes we are talking about high resolution or more precisely high mass accuracy data. High mass accuracy is 10 ppm or better. If your mass accuracy is better than that, hooray, everything works better. Our results improve and our running times also get much better. And we are talking about data dependent acquisition, DDA. So every fragmentation spectrum contains basically one compound. And if it, that's not the case, yeah, it gets a little bit more tricky. So this is what we can do out of the box. And if you need something different, yeah, you should probably talk to us and not simply apply our software and assume that it's working. So I've shown you this slide before, just a reminder. Very often we simply don't know what a particular tandem MS, what a particular query compound is. Now we know that it's, for example, not in the spectral library. And in the CSI finger ID talk, I then said, said uh, wouldn't it be more convenient to search in a molecular structure database, which is much, much more comprehensive, much larger, yeah, 1000 times larger or something. But the problem is, why should our query compound be in our structure database? It's larger, we'll find more, but nevertheless, there's a good reason to believe that we will still miss a lot. I have no idea how much, we'll see. Okay, we can only find out by making a method that can actually analyze such data. Because what you have to keep in mind is that the space, the total space of molecular structures that we could search in is enormous. And with enormous, I mean bigger than we can imagine. I showed you this slide in the CSI finger ID talk, and this is a crude extrapolation of the number of molecules with mass up to 1000 Dalton. It's actually from somebody else's paper. Uh, Kevin and Al actually computed that up to 150 Dalton, and then I extrapolated and assuming that there is still an exponential increase. It might be super exponential at some si uh, stage, but it doesn't look like it. But anyways, it's also restricted in the elements that they were considering. Even for those, you can make a rough estimation that you get something like 10 to the 80 structures with mass up to 1000 Dalton. And 10 to the 80 is an enormous number. That's the estimated number of atoms in the observable universe. Okay, It's so big that every number that you get into contact with on a regular scale is tiny, unbelievably tiny. And I try to show that here when I showed that PubChem in comparison is not small. PubChem, you wouldn't even see that here. It would be less than one pixel if I would draw that in a correct scale, okay? And that is PubChem has, a, has 100 million structures, so that's 10 to the eight. And 10 to the eight uh, compared to 10 to the 80, that's, wow, that's 10 to the 72 difference. And it doesn't even matter if you filter those structures by some very, very strict rules, which say it lets pass only one comp compound structure every quadrillion, or I don't know. It will still be 10 to the 60 structures. It's still unbelievably much more than the structures in PubChem. Okay? So this is what we have to keep in mind, and we have no clue how many of those structures are actually present in any sample out there. Now, one way how we could tackle it would be compound classes. I mean, we don't sometimes really have to know that a compound is a particular structure. It would be already very useful information to know that it's a particular compound class. And why is that? For example, you can look at enrichment studies. Enrichment studies are nowadays often done via pathways, but then pathways are there primarily for primary metabolites. So how do you actually say that something is up or down regulated in one sample compared to another sample? And one possibility are compound classes. An unfortunate thing there is that historically these compound classes were defined, often defined based on metabolic precursors. So this compound was made from this precursor, so it belongs to this class. 
And this meant that the same compound and also the same structure might simultaneously be part of the class and not be part of the class. Both things at the same time, depending on which organism you're looking at. But you can definitely not see the organism or the biological potential of an organism if all you have is a few spectra. So this is not nice. We, if we see a structure, we cannot decide um, what compound classes this structure is. And what we want to do, that's our goal here, we want to have a query tandem mass spectrum and we want to decide which, of, uh, which classes does this belong to. So if we can't even do that for the structure, how can we do it if all we have is a tandem mass spectrum? So we start to think about compound class prediction as early as 2015. But when we noticed that, yeah, there are these problems with compound classes, we didn't really think this was possible. And then in 2016, we were super happy that uh, the group of David Bishard came up with Classifier, which is a beautiful tool that allows you to compute, deterministically compute the membership of any molecular structure in 4,825 compound classes. Now I'll mention that again in a second, but you already see that here. Classifier is a little bit different from what uh, some chemists might be used to in that it assigns multiple classes to the same structure. For example, here it's a clavam and a beta clavam at the same time. And in fact, every beta clavam will be a clavam. Okay, I'll come back to that in a second. But the thing is, classifier can do that for every structure that we have, any structure that you find in a database, any structure that you can draw. As soon as it's there, as it's drawn, classifier can predict all of those compound classes. And I already mentioned that these classes are hierarchical and that makes a lot of sense. Every flavonoid glucoside is also a flavonoid. So you'll get a yes to the answer, is this a flavonoid glucoside? And to the answer, is that a flavonoid? And not just to the answer, is that a flavonoid glucoside? And that makes a lot of sense. Same for sphingolipids and lipids, okay? In the end, everything, all of these classes are parts or, or subclasses of organic compounds. So there are different levels which you can order now these classes into. And uh, the most interesting part is probably here at the class, subclass and level five levels. And you see that not every structure, these are now structures simply taken, I don't know, I think from a biomolecular uh, structure database. And you check how many of them have an annotation in a class at these different levels. And you see that not all of them have a classification at these lower levels. Because what happens is that these classes become smaller and smaller and smaller. There might be as few as a single compound or even zero compounds in all of PubChem that belong to a particular class. Okay, But that's not a problem because you have these other classes and because it's hierarchical, even if there was no class flavonoid glucoside, you would still have the class flavonoids. So that makes a lot of sense. And in fact, many things are organized like that. In fact, it's not a hierarchy, it's an ontology, but I don't want to go into the details here. I know it's a little bit different and you should also be aware that these classifier classes are not defined in the way that they are usually defined. They have the same names, so that might be a little bit confusing, um, but you can now do that for all of PubChem and that's an advantage that's so big that, yeah, we, we couldn't ignore that. So I will concentrate on classifier classes in the rest of my talk. But it should be mentioned that Canopus is in a way restricted to these classifier talks, uh, classes. There's nothing magic about them, okay? So if there are other classes, other ontologies, other whatever, classification systems, we can also predict them. And we already do that. 
we do that for these NP classifier classes, okay, which I heard are pretty useful, particularly in nat natural products research. So they were in there from the beginning, first version of Canopus that was released already predicted them. They are just not available in the graphical user interface, but you can parse them from the output that Canopus is writing. And in the near future, they will also be available in the graphical user interface. And if there are other compound classes, we can also predict them. The only thing that we need is we need a method that given the structure tells us if it's this compound class or not. Now we have pretty much the same question or very similar question that we had uh, a few slides, no, a talk ago. And that is, we now want to predict all the compound classes when all we have is a tandem mass spectrum. Yeah. Can we predict them from the tandem mass spectra? Now, luckily, I hope you have all seen the CSI finger ID talk. We have the voodoo chicken. And the voodoo chicken do exactly that, or almost exactly that. You remember they are given a query spectrum and they are given the, the fragmentation tree, um, which is computed directly from the fragmentation spectrum. No database, no structure, no spectral library attached, nothing. If you don't know what that means, you can watch the Sirius talk where I explain that in a lot of detail. Anyways, so our voodoo chicken sees these two things and then it tells us, does it contain a carboxyl group? And if we can train such a voodoo chicken, what about a voodoo chicken for compound classes? Let's train one that tells us whether or not a query spectrum belongs to the flavonoid glucoside class. And all the voodoo chicken has to do is say yes or no. Luckily, we already have that voodoo chicken ready. I mean, it's obviously not a voodoo chicken, as I explained, too expensive, and I don't know actually where to put them. Um, so we rather use machine learning. And we can directly use our CSI finger ID pipeline that I explained in the last talk. And all we have to do is replace a few words here. <clears throat> Whenever we speak about molecular properties, we now speak about compound classes. And we now call it not canopus because this is not canopus, but direct prediction. And that can now predict you for any tunnel mass spectrum, all the compound classes this compound belongs to. Now, this method is not canopus. This is a method that I will call direct prediction, and it's one of the baseline methods that we will evaluate against. Baseline method, for those of you, who are not uh, familiar with the term doesn't mean that this is something stupid or not a very smart method. In fact, I would argue that what I just presented you is the best direct prediction method that you could currently come up with because uh, it gets all the smart ideas from CSI finger ID, the multiple kernel learning and so on and so on. All of that is in there. So I don't think you could come up with a better direct prediction method. Or if you can, we'll actually use that to improve CSI finger ID as well. And one important thing about uh, direct prediction is not only how it will compare against in, uh, Canopus in the end, but also that it has certain issues. And I will now talk a little bit about those issues. And one pretty clear issue is that we cannot predict compound classes for which we have no training data. Okay, if we have no flavonoid glucosides in our MSMS training data, then we cannot possibly build a predictor for flavonoid glucosides. Okay, and that's pretty obvious. Not clear why I'm even mentioning that here, but you should be aware that this is the case for the majority of classes in classifier. Many of these classes are very, very small, and we have very little training data, if any training data, and also be yeah, aware that this is not a zero one decision. This is not a, we can train something or we cannot train something. Are five examples enough to train a classifier for flavonoid glucosides? Or do you need, do you need 10? And CSI finger ID, for example, we use something like 50, 25 or 50, this changed over time, yeah? 
And we are well aware that for those where we have very few training examples, positive training examples, the predictor will not be of the same quality. So you can never be sure that it's actually doing something useful. So in many cases, we won't be able to predict something or we won't be able to predict something that is reliable. So quite obvious. Why am I even mentioning it? We will see in a second. The second problem is even worse, or the second issue. And that is not related to classes, but related to class-subclass relationships. Let's assume we want to make a predictor for flavonoids. And this is now our usual training data, MSMS training data, and that contains flavonoid glucosides and other flavonoids, MSMS data from those. And then we make our direct, direct prediction predictor for flavonoids and we evaluate that only on the flavonoid glucosides. And this is obviously all done with the usual structure disjoint cross-validation that I explained in the talk about CSI finger ID. So it has never seen the spectrum before, it has never seen even the structure before the classifier to ensure that it's not just memorizing, then it would be useless in flectors. And you see that this predictor is pretty good. It correctly predicts uh, that those flavonoid glucosides, tandem mass spectra, are flavonoids for 91% of those spectra. So that's very successful classifier. But I already said that for many compound classes, we don't have any training data. Now let's assume this would have happened for flavonoid glucosides. So we cut out all the flavonoid glucosides mass spectra from the training data. And again, we make a predictor, direct prediction predictor for the flavonoid class. This time it has not seen a single spectrum from a flavonoid glucoside. And now we are mean and we ask the predictor, are those flavonoid glucoside, tandem MS, are those flavonoids? I mean, we have a flavonoid predictor, it should be doing something, right? So can that work? And the answer is not for direct prediction. Only 8% of the flavonoid glucosides are correctly predicted to be flavonoids. So we didn't notice it, but the absence of this class, or in this case, the subclass of flavonoid glucosides also made a pretty useless predictor for flavonoids. And that's a really big issue. Because you might think that this is a theoretical issue, but it's not. And the worst thing is that we are not even aware how bad it is. Okay, I try to come up with a nice quotation about what I'm wanting to say here, but I couldn't find one, so I had to come up with one myself. Yeah. The, the idea should be clear. We should not fear those cases that we can see. We should fear those cases that we can't see. I mean, we can test for all the classifier subclass versus class things if these predictors will be lopsided, if they haven't seen a complete subclass. And so they are doing something, but not what we expect them to do. And again, this is no simple yes, no answer. Is five... Uh, Sub, five uh, examples from the subclass enough or is then the complete classifier already useless? I don't know. Maybe it's 10, maybe it's 7, maybe it's 25. Depends on the data. But what is much worse is that those classifier classes are just a snapshot of what is real. I mean, there are other class subclass relationships in there which we don't see in the classifier hierarchy. Yeah. If flavonoid glucosides weren't in the hierarchy, we wouldn't even know about that if the training data was missing. And so you can make arbitrary subclasses uh, and then check if the training data is always in there. You could if you had yeah, infinite amount of information, but we don't. So we don't even know which ones we have to check here. And I would say that for basically every compound class, the training data that we have in our MSMS is not 
balanced or representative, meaning that you will always end up with a classifier who will miss certain subclasses. Not classifier subclasses, but other subclasses. So direct prediction has a few issues. If we could wish for anything that we want to, what would we wish for? Well, we would wish it's a magical wish list, so we don't have to care if this is possible or not. We would wish for a method that does not fall for the step class or this class issue. But let's take that one step further. Let's say we also want a method that is able, capable of predicting classes for which we don't have any training data in our MS, MS spectra. Nothing. Okay, not a single positive example. How is that possible? I don't care. It's a magical wish list. We are allowed to ask for everything. Then obviously our method should follow the design principles which I met, mentioned uh, in the beginning. And then it should also perform better than anything out there. And in this case, because there are no met other methods available currently, uh, except for direct prediction variants and yeah, one other method that I will mention later, which is also just a baseline method. It should at least perform better than these baseline methods. Okay. On top of everything else, it should be magic and perform better because these, for example, direct prediction, it performs quite well in practice because you never notice in your evaluation, all of these issues, they simply don't happen there. If you have no spectra, you cannot evaluate a predictor. Oops. Okay. How can that happen? You really have to dig for it to see that these bad things are actually happening. So we want something that gets around all these issues and then in the end is also better than everything else. Now, Canopus. Okay. Canopus uh, is the second brightest star in the sky after Sirius. Um, Canopus also is an acronym for something. I'm not going into the details. It's not that important, but if you're wondering uh, why I always present, if you have seen another presentation about Canopus, I always present this very beautiful picture. This is an illustration by John Schoenherr. It's not Canopus, but it's actually a rather famous fictional planet that is circling around Canopus. And if you are a nerd like I am, then you might want to find out what it is. And I can maybe help you by telling you that the font in which I printed Canopus is called Orthodox Herbitarian. Okay, that's for the nerds. So we started off with this direct prediction method and we had the issue that we often do not have training data, positive training data, simply because there's so little training data and there are so many classes. So we have to always train something from very few examples or most of the classes. And the only way we could overcome this if we, uh, was if we could acquire other data somehow. Okay, we can't measure more spectra. We can, but this takes long, long time and is very expensive. Is there anything else we can do? Well, there is PubChem and there are 100 million compounds in PubChem. Is there any way that we can use the structure data that we have in PubChem or other structure databases to actually improve our methods for compound class prediction? And this is something I learned over time that is very special to how bioinformaticians approach such problems. It's very normal for a bioinformatician to sidetrack problems. We are often faced with some problem from biology that we want to solve. And then somebody comes up with a formulation that is in the computer science language. And then you notice this is a very bad problem to solve. It's, it's hard, it's provably hard. And so there will probably be no efficient algorithms and so on and so on. And then you could try to make better algorithms to, you could try to improve or you sidestep. You try to formulate your biological problem a little bit different and suddenly everything gets better. Okay. And you try to find 
a formulation of the problem so that on the one hand you can get nice solutions and those solutions are then also relevant for the original problem. So back to molecular fingerprints. I introduced molecular fin fingerprints in my talk about CSI finger ID, but back then I already told you originally those fingerprints have nothing to do with mass spectrometry. So let's forget about mass spectrometry for the moment. Let's just consider what they were originally made for. And what they were made for originally, the Morgan fingerprints 1965, was to check if a structure is already in a structure database. Because checking if two molecules, molecules are identical is already a nasty problem from a computer science perspective. It's graph isomorphism. And back 1965, that wasn't solved at all. There were no efficient algorithms. Now this has, is better, but it's still not a very nice problem. At some stage, people noticed that you can also check if two molecules are similar, and it's still one of the most used methods for this task. And the idea is that you transform your structure into a binary fingerprint. Uh, warning, this is not the encoding of uh, neither this nor this molecule. It's just something else, because we have two anyways that we would have to compare. And such a fingerprint encodes at each position, or fingerprint type encodes at each position, a particular substructure. And that's fixed for each fingerprint type. For example, there might be 166 such bits, and that's the max fingerprint. And then for each position, you know what it actually means. And you simply check whether or not the substructure is part of your molecule, yes or no. And if it's in there, you put in a 1. If it's not in there, you put in a 0. And afterwards, to compare the two molecules, you simply have to compare the binary fingerprints, which is relatively easy. That then leads to so-called Tanimoto coefficients. Now, let's sidestep. I told you bioinformaticians like to sidestep. Let's consider a completely different problem. Not a completely different problem, but a pretty different problem. What's the different problem? Let's assume we would know the exact, the correct, the perfect molecular fingerprint of the query. So just zeros and ones, can we then predict its compound class or all compound classes at the same time? Actually, that's the better way of thinking of it, okay? Now, the difference between our original problem and this problem is now that we can train this classifier using all the structures in PubChem because we can predict for each of those compounds in PubChem, all the compound classes. So we have loads and loads of training data to predict this or to train this predictor. And if we have millions of structures, millions of training examples, then we can actually start to think about deep neural networks. Yeah, it's, it's pretty tough to train deep neural networks if you have only thousands of training examples. Some people nevertheless do that, and I would be very careful. You should be a pro uh, doing that. You should be an ing or, or somebody else who really knows what they are doing if you do that. Um, but millions of training examples, that's good. Then a deep neural network, if you use the regular precaution that you do when you train deep neural networks, that should be trainable from that data. Okay, unfortunately, this is a completely irrelevant problem because I told you that we know for all of our training examples, the exact compound classes because that's what classifier can compute for us, okay? So why are we training a deep neural network to predict those compound classes when we already know them? I mean, if we have to know the structure to compute the fingerprint, right? Right? No. Because you might remember the battery of Voodoo Chicken, which I introduced in the CSI Finger ID talk. And this battery of Voodoo Chicken can predict a molecular fingerprint. All that we need is a ton MMS of the query compound. And then you get the fingerprint of the molecular structure without knowing the structure. There is no need to know that. In other terms, 
We have the CSI finger ID workflow, which is now taken from the PNS paper. This is now the complete workflow. And there is the training up here. And we don't need that because we simply use the training that CSI finger ID has already done. We just steal the prediction part and we discard the scoring phase, which actually searches in a molecular structure database. All of that can go. And all that we need here is the middle part which is the battery of voodoo chicken, but now in machine learning terms, it's multiple kernel learning and then a battery of support vector machines. So what we do now is we stitch together these two machineries. We have borrowed this part from CSI finger ID. And you have to understand this was originally a part of CSI finger ID. It was invented as a part of CSI finger ID, but that doesn't mean we can't steal it. We can't take it out. It's no longer CSI finger ID. It's just the fingerprint prediction. And that takes as input our spectrum, computes a fragmentation tree from that. We don't need any other information. And then it goes through here and out comes a predicted fingerprint. That now tells you whether your molecule contains certain small subgroups, yes or no, with a probability. And in the second step, we use our DNN, which we have trained on the structure data and we put in uh, the predicted fingerprint and out come all compound classes as our predictions. Now that's very nice. Now we did some more tricks to make Canopus very robust when you apply it to real world biological data. And it turned out that these other improvements did not really improve anything with regards to evaluation metrics. The, yeah, all our predictions more or less state the same quality in the evaluation. But the thing is, we always evaluate using this reference data, which is not looking like real biological data in some ways. And so we tried to make our method more robust. As I said, that didn't show up in the evaluation matrix, but we believe it makes it better, work better, for real world data. And the trick that we used is uh, the original DNN was trained with ideal fingerprints. As I said, we use classifier and then we get a zero one fingerprint and we use that as input for our DNN. But now we deliberately, to deliberately disturb this fingerprint, this ideal fingerprint to look more like a fingerprint that would be predicted by a battery of support vector machines. So that makes some errors. Some of these molecular properties should be one are predicted zero, okay? And that is not so sure about other positions. Like it's only 80% sure that this is a one or 70% sure this is a zero. And we actually use that in a way so that we perturb a real fingerprint. We have no idea what this fingerprint would look like if you measure an MSMS for it, but we perturb the ideal fingerprint in a way that looks really reasonable uh, how a fingerprint might look like if we would measure an MSMS for this compound and apply the battery of support vector machines. And then we use these perturbed fingerprints to train the deep neural network. And this is more about the paradigm of universality. We want it to be applicable to real world data, okay? Not just work very nicely for the reference data which we have, which is super high quality. So this is the machine learning model uh, all taken together. Uh, it's now, you can think of it as one big model, but different parts of this model are trained using different data. This first layer of this now large DNN is trained using thousands of mass spectra. And that's actually a battery of support vector machines. But in the end, this is all the same. Yeah, you have to, it's a matrix uh, vector multiplication. And then the other layers are trained in the DNN on structure data. And we can use millions of structure here, millions of structures to actually get a good model for that part. And we have never seen something like that before in the machine learning literature. So maybe we really invented that and we call it heterogeneous training. Maybe this, this exists somewhere. If so, please let me know. I would like to cite the papers, but yeah, maybe it's new. Maybe really got a new machine learning technique.
It's a very special one. I don't know if it can be applied anywhere else. One last thing, and that's about being comprehensive. I always like to mention that Canopus is very comprehensive because it takes any Tandem MS and it predicts all compound classes for this query. Now, some people say, but some compounds do not fragment, some compounds do not ionize. And I can say, yes, obviously, our computation method can only be as comprehensive as the, the experimental data that we have as input. Okay? If you would not measure anything, we could also not predict compound classes. And that's true, but that's trivial. Or I don't know, if a meteor strikes and destroys the whole world before we predict something, we cannot predict it. But that's all, yeah, obvious restrictions. But if you leave that away, I would say we are comprehensive. But then some people mentioned that classifier has 4,800, more than 4,800 classes, and we only predict 2,500. Why do I still think this is comprehensive? Because this was a deliberate decision. So we don't predict the other compound classes because we don't want to predict them. And why do we not predict them? There are good reasons for that. I mean, there's a lot of compound classes which are actually for inorganic compounds. And we are focusing on organic compounds. That's where we have our tandem MS training data. If there's a good reason to also predict some of the uh, those inorganic compound classes, then please tell us so we can add them. And we also have to make sure that we have the training data to do that. Other classes that we are discard, uh, discard are those which are extremely sparse. They are so sparse that we don't even find examples in PubChem. And if we don't even find examples in PubChem, what good will such a compound class be for you? For example, there's this compound class, uh, epoxyicosatrionic acids, sorry. And if you look through all of PubChem, no, it's not even a PubChem. It contains only a single structure in classifier. Only a single structure is listed. Okay. Now we don't predict that class, but do you expect to ever see that in any LCMS MS run from a biological sample ever? Probably not. Probably not in the next 10,000 runs you are doing. What we do is we predict classes, icosanoids and epoxides. Because, as I mentioned repeatedly, classifier is hierarchical. So even if we don't predict the subclasses, we still predict parent classes, which are large enough. And those are large enough, so we have enough training data in there, and we will predict them. So we are not telling you we can predict this class. No way. It's not possible. Yeah, But we are telling you that. We are telling you we are not going to predict that. There will be no predictor for that. So we won't give you false information, which in the end turns out to be wrong almost all the time. Yeah. But we can predict all these other classes and they will be probably very helpful. They, be, be, they will be those where you make statistics for, for the biological cases, which I will show in a few seconds. Such a class is so small. If you compare it to samples and say, how many of those are in sample one compared to sample two, it will be zero in both cases. How interesting is that? And with that, we are already done with the method. And now I'll show you evaluation results. Now, the first thing that comes into mind when people talk about yeah, such predictions and, and measuring the quality of these predictions is they want to use accuracy. That's simply the fraction of correct predictions. Now, I have to tell you that our accuracy is, is mind boggling. Which, which is it's 99.7% uh, accuracy. So only 0.3% of the cases we predict something wrong. And that's true both for the cross-validation and for the independent data and that structure disjoint evaluation and everything. Okay. And like 2,345 classes out of the 2,497 classes were predicted with an accuracy of at least 99%. So that sounds super cool. 
but in fact it's not and the problem here is that a lot of these classes are tiny as i already said they're very small so we have very few positive examples even the larger ones we have much fewer positive examples than negative examples many more compounds are not a lipid than they are lipid even though lipids is a large class so a much better way to measure that are uh, coefficients such as the f1 coefficient or even better and that's what we use here the matthews correlation coefficient it's a very nice measure for such a prediction quality because it's a balanced measure that is it's always between minus one and plus one it's always zero for random prediction so if you randomly say yes or no you will always get zero um, as a matthews correlation coefficient it's always plus one for the perfect prediction and it's always minus one for the anti-perfect prediction so somebody deliberately saying the wrong thing all the time and this is now our average matthews correlation coefficient uh, on independent data which is also breathtaking 0.744 i would say a very good predictor has an mcc of 0.75 or better that's already super helpful and really strong and we get an average mcc that is almost 0.75 but this is just the averages what about the individual classes now you can now look at each individual class we have a huge table in our publication where you can see each individual class and we always tell you our mcc our recall and our precision for this individual class also the accuracy but as you see it's usually 99 point something percent except for the largest classes which yeah you have a few uh, positive examples so it gets a little bit harder you cannot always say no to reach a perfect prediction and these are now all the classes that are somehow connected to lipids just to give you an impression of all the classes that are in there it's no other reason than that and because i told you that csi finger id or all in silico methods are not really helpful for lipids but canopus is yeah canopus can predict all these lipid classes as i said our general setup doesn't have a big problem with lipids it's the evaluation of csi finger id that has a problem with it but okay we don't want to look through all of these classes can we get a different way of looking at it now here's another way of looking at it we check how many classes we can predict with a particular mcc like mcc 0.9 to 1.0 those are super good predictors almost perfect predictors and now you see now how many classes canopus can predict that's about 60 uh, with an mcc between 0.9 and 1.0 uh, direct prediction is the blue one here it's going up here here and here so that's fewer fewer classes that you can predict with these super high mcc yeah the best ones the best predictors and there is another baseline that we evaluate against and i will explain that on the next slide but you also see that canopus is performing better than this other baseline methods and the other baseline method that we evaluate against this is yeah an archetypical baseline method and that's k nearest neighbor what you do is you have some similarity measure some search engine it doesn't matter in our case it can be for example csi finger id it can be library searching or it can be metfrag those were the three that we used and then we search either in the spectral library or we search in say pubchem with metfrag and csi finger id for those two we limit that actually to those structures which have the correct molecular formula because otherwise we have 100 million uh, candidates not really helpful then you rank all candidates and then you only consider the top k candidates the best scoring candidates okay those spectra that get gets the highest cosine score and then you look around your query and check for the top three for example how many say the compound class is a no and how many say the compound class is a yes you do that for every compound class individually and in this case uh, k and n for k equal three would say no for the compound class if you would use k and n with k equals five it would say yes because you have three votes for yes okay red is no and blue is yes quite obviously okay 
You do that individually for each compound class, and then you get a prediction for the complete yeah, set of molecule, uh, compound classes. Now, this method also has certain issues. And I'm not going into the detail. And if you want to know about these issues, please see the paper. There are actually other issues which are well known that KNN is not able to cope with, like the curse of dimensionality and things like that. Um, but it also has some practical issues, like if you're using Metfrag or CSI Finger ID to search in PubChem and you're limiting it to the molecular formula, then you might actually end up with no candidates. And so you can't actually apply this okay and you might yeah this this violates our universality universality paradigm and you might now play around with it a little bit and then say oh if there are no candidates i'm also considering this and this and this molecular formula yeah but this is no no longer scientific elegance this is then also not very simple this is there's a good chance that your method will then in the end work very well for the data that you're evaluating it on, but it will never work for any other data because you have done manual overfitting to the data. So KNN is known for these issues. They don't show up in any evaluation. In evaluations, KNN is usually very hard to beat. And here is another way of looking at the results and how good Canopus is against the baseline methods, and that is looking at precision and recall individually. Precision is, uh, yeah, how many of those things where we said, yes, it belongs to the compound class, actually belong to the compound class, and recall is how many things that belong to the compound class, where, how often do we say, yes, it is part of this compound class? And you see that, yeah, there's two very good methods which regards to precision and that is um, the direct prediction is very good uh, with regards to precision but Canopus is as good as it and the other methods are a little bit worse but then there's also recall and recall is very important how many of the positive examples out there how many sphingolipids do we actually say yes this is a sphingolipid because saying no all the time is a valid answer but it's not a really helpful one right and you see that Canopus is by far the best method when it comes to recall. Yeah, Many of those compound classes are predicted with recall above 0.6. Some are not, but this is really just because there are some compound classes which are so tiny that it's super hard to ever say, yes, it must be part of it. Okay. So let us come back to this class with a subclass problem. I told you about it for direct prediction. Direct prediction has issues there. What we did was we removed all flavonoid glucosides from the training data and then try to build a predictor for flavonoids and doing so evaluating it only on flavonoid glucosides, seeing how many of them are predicted correctly to be flavonoids. Direct prediction only gets 8% correct. Now, Canopus gets 51% correct. This is still far from perfect, that's for sure. But I have to tell you, this is no sweet spot evaluation, meaning that we found out later that the example of comparing flavonoid glucosides and trying to predict if they are flavonoids is actually pretty hard. It gets easier if you try that with bile acids and try to predict if they are steroids. Okay, there we get 83% correct. So I mean, it's not perfect, but you cannot expect us to do magic, right? That's not possible, right? Petrificus totalus. Oh, that worked. So maybe we can do a little bit of magic. And here is the magic. You remember on our magical wish list, I asked if we could predict those classes where we don't have any MSMS training data. And for cannabis, that's actually possible. If we have flavonoid glucosides in our training data and we try to predict flavonoid glucosides, we get an MCC of 0.922, which is darn good. But if we now remove all the tandem mass spectra from flavonoid glucosides and build the predictor for flavonoid glucosides and evaluate them on the flavonoid glucoside tandem MS spectra, we still have an MCC of 0.66, which is pretty good 
pretty darn good for this very extreme case. I mean, this is super extreme. All of them are gone. And again, the example of bile assets, there the MCC drops to 0.764 and I said 0.75. That's still a very good predictor. So in total, it's not magic, but it's, it's as close as we can get with machine learning. And this ends the evaluation part of my presentation. You should keep in mind that numbers will probably get better over time. This is just a snapshot uh, with the current training data that we have available. The numbers are those numbers that I presented you. But I think it's already demonstrating that Canopus is working quite nicely. And now we will focus on a few biological applications just as a demonstration of all the different things that you can do. And I will only quickly go over that because we are already running late, but just so that you can get a few ideas. Now the most natural application that comes into mind to use Canopus is probably to compare two samples. To compare the compound class distribution between two samples. So we have one uh, LCMS MS run from one sample and another one from another sample. For example, two different or forbia species, Superisias, I hope I'm saying this halfway decently, and Balsamifera. And we want to compare them. What compounds do they actually produce? And it turns out the compound classes of those compounds are pretty different. And you might notice that tritopanoids looks bigger here than here, but that's not true. Like it's almost exactly the same number of compounds that are annotated as tritopanoids. The big difference is the uh, ditopanoids here. And you can see there are other differences based on the compound class, on the compound class level. Now keep in mind that those are not annotated compounds. I have no clue what those are. Some ditopanoids. I, as I said, don't care. Uh, really. 10% might be annotated or maybe not, but I can, we can tell you for sure that the other ones are also ditopanoids. I don't know if this already triggers something and you say, oh, this is interesting. There must be something going on. But as I said, maybe this is enough information. Also noticed, I already mentioned that, that we don't always have to go very deep into the classifier um, hierarchy. These higher classes, uh, they, they sometimes contain the more interesting information because if we go deeper and deeper and deeper in the end, there will be one or two compounds in every compound class. That's not even very helpful. And most compound classes actually con don't contain a single compound. Now, this might be helpful or we might look into a little more detail into that. We can do the same in more detail for only the ditopanoids, but now for all the different euphorbia species, that's the absolute on the left and the relative on the uh, right for just ditopanoids. I'm not going into the detail. Uh, I must say that, by the way, this is not our data. That's taken from the Ernst et al. publications and Frontiers of Plant Science. Or you might look at a chemodendrodrum. So you Take all the different compound classes, all the compound class annotations of the different species, and then you make a similarity matrix from that, and then you apply hierarchical clustering to that. And what you get out of it is a hierarchical clustering here. And you can now compare that to the phylogenetic tree and see if there are similarities or if there are differences and why there are differences, maybe you can explain them. And then you might notice that actually the chemodendrogram agrees very well with the phylogenetic tree. And the big differences between those, uh, at least for the high level clades, uh, those are species that are succulent, which uh, means that the chemodendrogram contains information both about the phylogenetic relationships between the species and their lifestyle. And that you might find that interesting. Next example, here we compared the digestive, sy uh, digestive system of germ-free and specific pathogen-free mice, where you see that through the uh, uh, digestive system there are 
particular differences for particular compound classes. So three that are particularly interesting here are bile acids, phenolipids, and uh, gluconic acids. Uh, gluconic acids, sorry. So whatever that means to you, I can't really tell you. Okay. Um, or these are all the ones that show a fold change larger than tenfold between the samples. Again, we can't really tell you what is what are those uh, glucosyl compounds because they have not been annotated, they have not been under, uh, identified. The only thing we can tell you is there is a glycosyl compound and it's up or down regulated. Potentially enough information for the next analysis step. Or you take that to the yeah naturally next step and that is you estimate significance. Are things significantly up or down regulated? Um, by the way, the MICE data is again not from our publication, from our work, that's from a, the Quinn et al. paper in Nature 2020. And we just looked if compound classes now as an entity are up or down regulated or and whether this is significant or not. And the nice thing is that we don't have to restrict our analysis here to any pathways or something. I mean, for all of these compounds, probably these compounds are not even contained in any structure database. How can we possibly uh, put them into any pathway? We have no clue about the pathways, but the compound class we can assign. And then we see that, uh, for example, the cyclic alcohols and derivatives are very, very significantly up or down regulated. Okay, and you can look through this list and see if some of these compound classes might be interesting and might be so interesting that you want to dig a little bit deeper and see yeah, what that actually means. And you can also use our tools to draw really, really nice graphics. I mean, it's not completely true. This is not yeah, just our tool. That's a mixture out of the compound classes we assign and molecular networks. And the interesting part here is that although a molecular network means that all the different um, mass spectra that are connected here are very highly similar, which implies that probably also the structures behind them are highly similar, they might nevertheless be assigned different compound classes. And that can sometimes be done in error, but most of the times it really just means that yeah, they are structurally similar, but nevertheless belong to different compound classes. And again, both things together might give you additional information what this really means. And a final example of what you can do, and that's not me or us, that's Rafael Ria who did that. And he actually used uh, our tools Canopus to do structural elucidation full structural elucidation of a novel structure where the structure was not known before. I mean, obviously he didn't just use our tools. He, in the end, he also used NMR to check everything. But according to him, and you best have a look at the paper to check that according to him, all these different compound classes that Canopus assigned were extremely helpful to find the structure of this uh, yeah, peptidic compound. Uh, I'm not going into the detail, but here are all the structure, substructure predictions or the compound class predictions that Canopus provides for you. And you can decide for yourself. He color coded it very nicely, whether or not that would be helpful to find the structure of the complete uh, compound. So I already mentioned uh, the publication and I'm also showing you the preprint for that, and I'm just showing you that because I like the title of the preprint much better. Okay, it's my joke, so I like the joke, but um, yeah. Nature Biotech in the end said that, um, yeah, this is pretty witty and also funny, but unfortunately they don't like witty and funny title. And so we went for the other simpler title. One last problem, and uh, this is one of these uh, things, slides where you have to get excited, where we want Canopus now to assign compound classes to novel structures. To completely novel structures that nobody has seen before. 
Now, one thing that we really need for that is we have to compute fragmentation trees that are needed for the machine learning part and so on and so on. What we need is the correct molecular formula. This is not so much a problem when you do database search because you can just iterate over all possibilities and then just look for the best yeah, best scoring hit. CSI finger ID does that. Okay, if there are multiple molecular formulas, then no problem. But here we really have to know the correct molecular formula. And Zerios cannot do that for you, especially for large compounds, especially for compounds above 700 Dalton. And as I said, we cannot look up the formulas in a database because we are interested in novel molecular structures. So how can they be in any database? How can the molecular formula be in any database? And we have to consider all molecular problems and so on and so on. So excitement, but we already have to know the solution, at least if you followed me or my other talks. And that is Zodiac. Zodiac is still not perfect with molecular formula annotation, but it's uh, doing a much better job than Sirius in particular if the compounds get large. So whenever you use Canopus, you should definitely enable Zodiac. It will require a little bit more running time, but you should definitely invest that it's worth it. And maybe this now explained why, explains why we are still thinking a lot about molecular formula annotation. It's not because we don't have anything better to do. It's because we really need it as soon as we want to go de novo. And in the long run, isn't that the ultimate goal? This brings me to the end of my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. I think we don't have to recap much. I already said in the beginning, very, very special thanks to the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, which is responsible for funding all of this and all the stuff that I presented in the previous two talks. Um, the people here who, who did the work, this is only two people mostly, that's Kai Durkop, um, yeah, who did all the computer science and all the machine learning, but also the analysis, the biological, he, he is responsible for almost everything in this paper this time. And he got some help from Louis, um, yeah, who helped with, with all the chemistry and so on, and uh, yeah, is also responsible for a good part of the paper. And I already said what Canopus can do for you. Give it a 10 MMS, it will give you all the compound classes, thousands of compound classes that this compound belongs to. Obviously, only two, three, five, seven of these compound classes it will actually belong to, but it checks for all the thousands of them, okay? And it's not restricted by spectral libraries. It's not restricted by current structure databases. It just goes beyond. Good. And with that, I think we are done for this topic. And our next stop will then be cosmic. So hope to see you then. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Bye.